bottled in comfort and crazy cabin tech. Step into our Bentley. Fed up with fuel? We've got the top five ways to wean yourself of that habit. And technologies to cure the lousy driver. Do they work? Time to check the tech. We see cars differently. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. Welcome to CNET on Cars. This is the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. I drive about 100 cars a year to report back to you here. Maybe none as difficult to drive as the Bentley Mulsanne. Not that it's missing an automatic transmission or power steering, all those conveniences, but you see, you have to be a Kardashian to deal with that car. You gotta love attention. People are constantly flagging you down. Roll down the window, how much does it cost? Flipping you off, the whole gamut. Once you deal with that, you get in the back seat and you're presented with some incredible technology integrations. The Bentley Mulsanne, named for a turn on the Le Mans race course. Kind of a cheeky thing for a car that is some 16 feet long some three tons of girth, some 700 foot-pounds of torque. This, in many ways, is the ultimate Bentley. And ours has some of the most trick tech you'll find in any back seat on Earth. Let's drive this 2012 Mulsan and check the tech. Now, the Mulsan is a far less known Bentley compared to the Continental GT, which is in every rap video and CEO's driveway from coast to coast and around the globe. This guy is a rarer bird, but has some similar athletic lines, including this very coupe-like D-pillar back here, and also this kind of powerful haunch line back here, which is a Bentley signature. They call it the power line or something. Spot a Mulsan thousands of yards away by its very evocative giant dual headlights reaching back to the look of Bentley's in W.O.'s days. And the fenders and quarter panels with all these complicated creases and shapes are largely one piece. They do some nice aluminum forming on this car. Now, Bentleys can be used as a car you drive, but they can also be a car in which you are driven. That's where the back seat comes in. Phenomenal. Let's go to what you may think is your usual picnic table. Even Jaguars have these. But it's not just a picnic table that is powered. But if you push this button on the corner, we have the optional integrated iPad with the wireless keyboard. Pretty slick. And of course, the iPad here is 3G, so it's got its own connection. But that's part of a theme where this is primarily clever fitment more than technology. Now, the other interesting piece of technology in this car lives in the center console. We don't have all the goodies, but we do have our own climate system, our own reclining massage seats, and you can get a cooler back here, basically a champagne fridge with a frosted glass front door that has the bottles canted in such a way that a partly consumed bottle won't spill. CHP is going to love that. And you've also got a remote here so you can run the front head unit. I can change the channels, I can change the volume, I can drive the first row people nuts. And this isn't even all the toys, folks. If you get the theater option, you end up with a 15.6 inch center display that shows up here, and all that ties into the car's system and to a Mac Mini they mount in the trunk, and it's connected wirelessly. And if that's not enough, everywhere you look, here and in the front, nice cast metal polished ashtrays. This is another world. Now, before we examine the usual technology in this Bentley, let's examine the tactile technology. As they like to say, everything that looks like something in this car is what it looks like. Leather, obviously, is leather. Polished steel, this is actually polished steel. These look like glass covers on some of these buttons. They're cold. They are glass. And even these little pulls here for the vents, they feel like they're pulling some kind of a valve back there to open the air, but they're actually not. They're just electric switches but they dampened them to feel like they're pulling a valve in an older car. Now we get to the real hardcore tech by pushing the screen button and 007-esque, you get a Peaky Boo screen. Many of you will recognize that as a slightly older Audi interface. Eight inch screen, non-touch. You've got a knob to turn here. You got a little mushroom button in the middle you can move around. It's just a little bit too fussy for my tastes. Four buttons around here that correspond to four menus in the corner of the screen. And then of course your dedicated buttons around it. 
All the major media sources, though, are without apology. You've got everything you'd want in this car. Bluetooth streaming, AM, FM with HD radio, switchable, satellite radio. Over here, you've got your option for, let's see, a six-disc CD, two SD cards. And then if you want to hook up other options, here in this nicely lacquered lined tray, you've got one of these little pigtails that goes to the Audi media interface. And this one, for example, is for iOS devices, older iOS devices, of course. Plays DVDs as well when you're parked, and you've got good meta tag information while streaming, at least on my Android 4.0.4 device on our day of shooting. We have the optional name audio system, high-end English stuff. Gives us 20 speakers around the cabin, 2200 watts of power. However, the problem with high-end audio systems that really are high resolution is they make low-res sources sound even crappier. I'm looking at you, satellite radio. Rear camera is good. Nothing cutting edge here, though. It gives you some trajectory. It gives you distance, and you can also change it up to be for either alignment of parking. Oh, by the way, check out the tech. Notice anything odd about it? The red line. 4,500 RPM. What is this thing, a UPS truck? That's the kind of grunt they've built into that motor. It's not about thrashing it. It's about low-end torque from the get. And nestled here in the bow of our Mulsanne is one hell of an engine. 6.75 liter twin turbo V8 doing 505 horsepower and 752 foot-pounds of torque. That's enough for three normal cars. You've got to have that, though, because this guy weighs damn near 6,000 pounds. Yet it gets to 60 in a sprightly 5.1 seconds. The downside is the MPG, 1118. There is a gas guzzler tax, as you might imagine, and I think we're averaging about seven in the real world. Another interesting note about these, these guys are all hand-built. Old Steve Brown put this one together. Hopefully he had a fireproof apron, because when this car is running, you can't touch anything north of the doors. If you hit a pedestrian, I'm not sure you're going to kill them or cook them. Oh, by the way, this car has cylinder deactivation. It can shut a few of them down when cruising to save gas. Imagine what it would consume if it didn't. Oh, this is a nice place to be. Driving this car is not so much driving, even when you are at the wheel, as much as it is being transported. You're so separate from the world and the road, which has its ups and downs. It has massive power, of course, but you've got to unbury yourself from so many gears in this automatic. Even when it's in sport mode, like I have it now, it always feels pretty not ready to romp. And this car porpoises quite a bit as you get the power on. Forever, the hood is rearing up and dropping down, which is kind of a real old school thing. That said, it feels light on its feet for the kind of car that it is. Now, what this car is really about is about changing the very nature about getting from here to there. The way you know it in other cars is completely different in this car. You almost arrive energized from the experience of driving, and I'm not making that up. And I must also say Bentley has done a really nice job of making a cohesive design language across this cabin. There's a consistency of quality feel throughout. For this price, there better be. So in sum, it's a car that transports you more than being about driving. It doesn't do a whole lot for me as a driver's car that's asking a lot of it. This car wants to be used as a motor car, not a sports car. Okay, we're gonna price this guy. You better sit down. Base is 345, 320. Gas guzzler tax, 3700. Destination, 2595. To get the iPads on those powered picnic tables with keyboards and a wireless hotspot as well, add 336 or really go CNET style and step it up to what they call the theater spec. That includes the whole iPad package, but also the big drop-down center screen with that champagne fridge, a 64 gig iPod touch, and a Mac mini in the trunk that lives in its own electric power drawer. Wireless keyboard and mouse, that raises the option total to $58,000, and now you're somewhere north of 409. Now, you don't have to drive a Bentley to have iPads mounted in the back. For proof, my colleague Wayne Cunningham mounted iPads in the back of a Chevy Aveo, a yellow one. Go to CNETOnCars.com for a link. It's actually a very useful tutorial. Now, as I've told you before, I've driven a lot of driver assistance technologies lately. Cars now can brake for you, steer for you, accelerate for you, all in the name of avoiding collisions. And it's clear, from my experience, these systems do work. The question is, 
do they help? And that's on the mind of the smarter driver. Lane departure system. They warn you when you drift across the line. Blind spot tech can alert you to cars or motorcycles you don't see back there. Adaptive cruise control maintains not just your speed, but also a set distance from cars ahead at that speed. And forward collision avoidance systems step on the brakes for you when you're about to rear end someone. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of bad driving cured, right? But researcher Steve Roberson at State Farm points out a few issues. The systems don't all work the same way. When one manufacturer's car brakes, steers, or beeps to help you could be very different from another manufacturer's. Some systems remain on, others need to be re-engaged every time you start the car. If you become dependent on these systems and then jump in a car without them, you may be more likely to have a collision. And lastly, crash avoidance technology can only do so much to prevent a crash. You can always overdrive it. A recent insurance industry study found that forward collision avoidance systems result in about 14% fewer claims compared to similar cars without that technology. On the other hand, lane departure warning systems are actually associated with higher rates of accident claims, though that's probably a statistical anomaly. Having these technologies and relying on them need to be two different things. Coming up, Bluetooth two ways and gasoline-free driving five ways as CNET on Cars continues. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. You know, nothing has changed the nature of technology in the cabins of our cars like Bluetooth. Bluetooth hands-free has utterly revolutionized the nature of calling while driving. Almost made it halfway safe. Now, Bluetooth's next trick is to revolutionize audio, music, with Bluetooth streaming. It's becoming nearly ubiquitous, and it's our CarTech 101. Now, Bluetooth streaming is technically known as A2DP, Advanced Audio Distribution Profile. What is that? You see, Bluetooth is full of profiles. One handles the transfer of your phone book to the car. One handles the Bluetooth call, the audio back and forth. This profile handles high fidelity, mono or stereo streaming from a device to your car in this automotive case. You initiate it the same way by pairing a phone like you do for calling. My phone's been paired here. I have telephone ability, but as you can see, I'm also playing audio from this device onto that screen. There I am playing music on my phone. There's the same music on the screen. It's coming over in high fidelity. It's not an exact echo of the screen. That's a different technology, but I'm able to do a couple things. Get the sound from here to the car, no wire, and I can do control, remote control. In other words, the car's buttons can control the phone's audio playback. If I hit the next track button here on the car, look what happens. It moves ahead of the next track on the phone and vice versa. Now, another profile that's working inside of A2DP is AVRCP, Audio Video Remote Control Profile. That's the one that allows this uh, transfer of control back and forth. It also handles metadata. Metadata is just track information. Artist name, track title, it shows up here, it shows up there. That's because the metadata got transferred to the car. You definitely want that. Some of the lamer A2DP systems don't use that part of AVRCP. You still with me? Now, a word about fidelity. I told you this is high quality streaming, but high quality is a funny word. You see, within the A2DP profile, there is the ability for these two devices, the car and the phone, to negotiate a bit rate. In other words, how much data are they going to use to move the music between the two of them? That may be lower than the bit rate of your music. In other words, it gets transcoded down. Transcoding isn't good, down isn't good either, but that can happen sometimes. And therefore, the music is going to sound perhaps worse than if you were listening to it without this wireless connection through, let's say, earbuds. That typically sounds fine. And you're already probably playing compressed MP3s off your phone, so don't go all audiophile on me. This is about convenience and getting rid of wires. Now, A2DP Bluetooth streaming is becoming pretty common in cars. Not quite standard, but when you find Bluetooth hands-free calling, you typically find Bluetooth streaming. A2DP works for both iPhones, iPod Touches, Android devices, anything that has Bluetooth streaming technology. It's kind of a lingua franca for wireless music playback. Now, while Bluetooth streaming is kind of the new thing, you can add it to that old thing that you drive. They make Bluetooth streaming adapter kits that plug into the aux jack on your existing car stereo. Go to cars.cnet.com and you'll find our reviews of the good ones. 
Coming up, I'm going to show you five cars that if you own one, you might forget how to work a gas pump. As CNET on Cars continues. Nineteen sixty four, the World's Fair at Flushing, Queens, and the jet age is in full swing. American automakers are eager to tap into everything jet. Chrysler does the most with their turbine car, with a production run of fifty actually delivered to consumers. Spinning at forty four thousand RPM and able to burn almost anything, the president of Mexico ran his on tequila. The turbine engine was unlike anything on the road, but not ready for prime time. Flash forward today and the Jaguar CX-75 concept car uses a pair of turbines to spin generators fast enough to power 778 horsepower worth of electric motors. And while it may void your warranty, I bet you could run it on tequila. But that costs about 40 bucks a gallon. Welcome back to CNET on Cars, and don't worry, we're not going to waste any good tequila, or even burn any gasoline for that matter, because our top five this time around is of cars that burn no fluid fuel. In fact, it's a list I couldn't even done a year ago. Top five electric cars that are ready for prime time from major manufacturers. Now, I'm going to rank these guys by my impressions, having driven four of the five. I'll also give you their range in miles and their MPGE. That's the miles per gallon equivalent. It's an EPA number. We'll also show you their MSRP before tax credits. Let's go. Number five, the oddly named Mitsubishi iMev. Range of 62 miles, MPGE 112. This one barely makes the cut because I don't know that American consumers are ever going to embrace the looks of this electric Easter egg. It also feels uncomfortably close to a golf cart when you're driving it, but I gotta say, it is fun to drive, like you're perennially approaching the 18th hole, and it costs under 30 grand. Plus, your rabbit will never complain about the ear room. Number four, the Smart Electric Drive. Range of 87 miles, MPGE 100. This is the newest car on the list. It'll also be the cheapest, with an MSRP around 25 grand. But I'm mostly excited about it as sort of a redemption for the smart car, which should have always been an electric car. I mean, with its current gas engine, it's truly one of the awful driving experiences in the world. This conversion may absolve many sins. Number three, the Nissan LEAF. Range of about 73 miles, MPGE 99. The LEAF is the Prius of EVs. Not in sales, but in its charmingly odd look, urban nature, and strong execution. You'd be surprised by its luxurious drive manners, cool cabin tech, and smartphone app. But I slotted at number three because the looks are just a little too barney, and it lacks the fast charger we're about to see in car number two which is the Ford Focus EV. Number two, by a whisker ahead of the Leaf. Range of 76 miles, MPGE 105. Pushing 40 grand, it makes one say, for a Focus? But the car looks great, leverages the underpinnings of a great compact car already, and has a sportier demeanor than the Leaf. It's also got this fast charge technology that can do a full charge in three to four hours on a 240 outlet. That can mean hours less on the nipple than against its competitors. Before I get to number one, I can tell you it's not going to be the Chevy Volt or the Fisker Karma. You see, those are not really electric cars in the pure sense. They're range extenders. They use a combination of electricity to drive them, but also gas engine to generate electricity. I'd call that a separate list for another time, except there aren't five of them to rank. The number one electric car, ready for prime time, without a doubt, has to be the Tesla Model S. Range of 140 miles on up, MPGE of 89. And it's the first EV to win car of the year. It looks hot, goes like hell, has great range, and can be optioned up to around 265 miles on a charge. Check out its 17-inch central cabin screen, rewrites the rules of cabin tech. On the other hand, the Model S starts close to 60 grand, and if you want the 265 miler, now you're pushing 80 and up. 
Still, this is the car that doesn't just accomplish an electric conversion, but sets a new level for the bar. All right, folks, hope you're enjoying CNET on Cars. If you want to subscribe to a feed of the show, head to our site, CNETOnCars.com, and you'll find the links for our RSS and iTunes feeds right there. While you're there, why don't you follow us on Twitter if you haven't already, and then you'll get my updates from the field as we shoot segments in between episodes. Thanks to Cars DeWidiac here in Corte Madera, California. I'm Brian Cooley. I'll see you next time we check the tech.